Uh, welcome, this is Terry Fox. We're going into section two, uh, talking about how to make uh, Serdes type circuits work. So you can go to my website to get more information or you can contact me at this location. Off we go. First of all, we have to talk about the nature of a Serdes signal. Now, we always talk about Serdes signals as being a differential type signal. But if we're going to use the word differential, the first thing we have to understand or make clear is uh, what do we mean by that word uh, differential? So arrow option, there we go. Now I got my pointer. Okay, here are some examples of classical true differential signaling. If I talk about plain old telephone service, uh, before cell phones and VOIP, we actually connected the telephone instrument to the central office through a 600 ohm copper wire uh, subscriber loop and on that 600 ohm loop we had a transformer at the uh, telephone instrument side and we had another transformer at the central office side and in between the two uh, was a, a 600 ohm subscriber loop so it was two copper wires where the wires were the same length and they were held at a given distance from each other and that's the way that we kept things like uh, for example lightning uh, out of being heard on the telephone because it really would uh, eliminate or at least greatly uh, attenuate uh, common mode noise. Now another example of this is 10 base T Ethernet over a twisted pair. So if you're going over Cat5 cable and you look just inside the edge of the computer. So let's assume that uh, let's assume that, that we had you know a router over here and we had the computer over here then right at this connector where that J45 connector plugs into and you and you move on to the cat5 cable just inside of it just inside that connector is going to be this transformer and just inside on the router side is going to be the transformer over here so what we've got is I've got a transformer here and a transformer here this is an unbalanced signal this is an unbalanced signal but as soon as I go through the transformer they are no longer unbalanced because we've got magnetic coupling through here and if this is positive this thing is negative and they are a perfect uh, match for each other and when it gets to the other end then it can go the other way so I could have this tied to a uh, a, a plug in the wall one place and this tied to a plug in the wall someplace else and if there was some sort of DC offset between these two sides it would make absolutely no no difference because these actual wires that connect it are not connected to uh, the uh, to the boxes as far as uh, uh, earth ground or, or power now If we go through and uh, talk about the characteristics of true differential, here you go. First of all, the driving signals are perfectly symmetrical due to the transformers on each end. So here, this is a board here, this is a board here, but in between, this is nothing more than twisted pair. And if you were to take a, a, a DC ohm meter, you could find no... Uh, path between either one of these wires and anything on the say the router on this side or the computer on that side so these signals are not referenced to power ground they're only referenced to each other they do not need a ground plane in other words this twisted pair uh, the the return current for the positive side is the signal on the negative side so the re the return current for this signal is that signal okay now the two conductors must be kept close together with a constant separation along the full length of the cable. 
to assure consistent coupling and impedance matching down there. So uh, consequently, if you're doing small things like like a Cat5 cable, uh, we would do this with uh, you know with a, a little twisted pair. Now, common mode noise rejection is excellent. If we talk about plain old telephone service, uh, you could literally have a lightning storm someplace, and since the lightning uh, would impinge a signal on both sides of the of the uh, differential pair, if you will, you would not hear it because they would become uh, they would become a common mode signal on both lines, and when they got to the transformer, they just simply canceled out, and you didn't hear any of that noise over on the receiving side. All right, you also had wonderful noise margin for, for true differential signals. I'm saying 12 dB, but it, it could be well in excess of that. So anytime that we talk about true differential, we're talking about all of these things. We're talking about the return current for one line being on the other line. We're talking about the fact that we don't need power or ground. There's no reference there. We don't need a ground plane. Uh, all of these things are true and the place where the grief comes is when we try to extrapolate from what we know about classical true differential signaling and say aha that's the way that Cerdes works the problem is that that isn't the way that Cerdes works and let's uh, move on to the next slide here oh by the way uh, the, the, the the noise for, for differential is very, very high. I mean, the noise Im immunity is very high for common mode noise. Uh, for reference, a single-ended 3.3-volt uh, CMOS signal only has about 2 dB of noise margin. So uh, these things, we used to make a joke, you could run uh, LVDS over a barbed wire fence. And if you ever wanted to send it over a barbed wire fence, I guess you could do that. But they had extreme... Uh, noise immunity and and a very high noise margin all right now Cerdes is an LVDS type signal basically on steroids now LVDS stands for low voltage differential signaling LVDS is LVDS the same as true differential well no not really LVDS is not true differential and it differs in some very important aspects. First of all, LVDS is most assuredly, most assuredly referenced to power and ground. I cannot run an LVDS signal of, apart from a reference to power and ground without coming up with some other issues uh, that can be very uh, troublesome. Now, the symmetry and the balance of the PN issues, if I was looking at true differential, it was determined by the transformer, and so therefore they were perfectly symmetrical and perfectly balanced. But in the LVDS, the PN signals are approximated by careful driver design in the driver itself. So we're, we're doing this in silicon, and the, the gates, although they try to make them as close as possible, are never perfectly matched. Now, the return current for the P signal is not the N signal. The return current is actually on, or primarily on, I should say, the reference plane. Now, if you put these things close enough together, you can get crosstalk and different issues come up, but I'll address that in the next slide. But uh, LVDS exhibits common mode a signal tolerance it's not as big as it was for the uh, like the plain old telephone service or, or Ethernet but it does have wonderful common mode tolerance and LVDS has substantial noise margin generally uh, 12 dB or better but I'm sure that when I said that LVDS uh, is uh, that the return current for the P signal is not on the N signal and is primarily on the reference plane that's some place where I'm sure a lot of hackles came up and people are saying well what are you talking about that's that's absolute heresy well 
I need to thank Lee Ritchie of SpeedingEdge.com. Uh, Lee, back many years ago, I'm not sure at about, might have been 99, might have been 2000, might have been 2001, two, something like that. He did a very famous article, which I'm ashamed to say I no longer have a copy of the article, but uh, it was one of those things that he brought some some very basic truth to this whole business and I'm very grateful that I learned that early in my career. So here we go. Low voltage differential signaling. Now how does this thing really work? If I look at low voltage differential signaling, what I've got, again this explanation came from Lee Ritchie so this is not original work by me, I'm just uh, parroting what he uh, uh, explained a long time ago. Uh, if I look at uh, LVDS here, there are two drivers. If I look at the A plus driver right here, it is controlled by this transistor and this transistor. Now, I have a second set of drivers over here, a second totem pole, if you will, and that is driving the A minus. So these two transistors drive A plus these two transistors drive A minus. Now for the moment let's imagine that this stuff isn't there so just get rid of that. So we'll just forget about it and all I'm going to look at is I'm just going to look at the A plus side of this. If this transistor is on and that transistor is off then A plus is tied to power through this resistor which is nominally say 50 ohms. So let's call it 50 ohms here. So if this one's on and that one's off I'm tied up there by 50 ohms. If this one is off and this one is on I'm tied to ground through this resistor 50 ohms. Now is everybody willing <coughs> excuse me is everybody willing to believe that if all I did is just toggle these transistors on and off that this thing would either be 50 ohms to power or 50 ohms to ground but that's all it can do it, it's either tied to power or it's tied to ground or it's in the in the midst of switching uh, but that's all it is now if this thing if, the, if it is either a drive point of 50 ohms to power or 50 ohms to ground what do you think this transmission line would, would like to be to be a perfect match? Well, how about we do a 50 ohm transmission line? So if it was a 50 ohm transmission line, and now I was coming down to this uh, termination resistor here, well, I guess that probably ought to be 50 ohms also. Now, if I've got a 50 ohm drive point, if I've got a 50 ohm transmission line, and a 50 ohm termination resistor, there are no reflections. No reflections. If on the other hand uh, I go through and I do the analysis on the other side of this, if I did the same analysis on the A minus, what I'd find is it's either 50 to power or 50 to ground, hence this guy is going to be 50 ohms if I want to make a perfect match and his res uh, terminating resistor that ought to be 50 ohms. So what we've got is that uh, if I've got A plus driving a current uh, that way and it's into a 50 ohm transmission line so I've got this coming down here and 50 and at the same time the minus side is going in the opposite direction so it's going this way and so it's got a current that way. Now if these two currents are equal there is no current out VTT and if there's no current out VTT then why use two resistors? Why not just put one resistor right here of 100 ohms? Now, this is the point at which everything gets a little goofy. Uh, 
because what do we call this this pair right here due to that resistor we call this a 100 ohm differential pair Now, when we call it a 100 ohm differential pair, people seem to go brain dead on me, and they think that that 100 ohm differential pair means that that is the same as this. And the problem is they are not the same. They are different. This is a completely different circuit. It has many characteristics that are similar to true differential but it is not true differential if I was to actually look at this this thing is uh, actually let me get rid of that this is actually come on give me my pointer back it's actually complementary single-ended so in other words what we call differential a more proper term would be complementary single-ended so it is critically important to understand that if these things are really two single-ended signals and not one differential signal that we have to keep that in mind now the place where this really uh, becomes important is when we take the shift and we go from low voltage differential to a Serdes circuit so let's go to Serdes and Serdes or gigabit serial or whatever name you want to use for it it's basically LVDS on steroids so if we look at it on the front end I've got a parallel to serial conversion I've got pre-emphasis or de-emphasis so that's more or less tuning up the signal that's being put onto this LVDS type pair uh, I got a couple blocking DC blocking capacitors for any noise that might be between these two places because very often when we're using uh, things like for example PCI Express you're going through a connector so it is reasonable that there'll be some offset to the DC there then on the receiver we've got uh, a similar sort of uh, termination that's either uh, in the silicon itself uh, but in addition to that we've got th we've got an equalizer inside there we've got clock recovery bit sync word sync frame sync serial to parallel and that's all the things that are uh, you know going on here now Lee Ritchie had a uh, uh, a very uh, uh, famous experiment that he did and he did this back in I don't know 1999 2000 2001 to whatever anyway it, it was a long time ago now at this time but it was it was addressing this argument of is this pair a true differential because people could take a 75 ohm trace and if we pull them close enough together I can get a difference of impedance between the two of say 100 ohms now is that the same thing as taking two 50 ohm traces so if this was 50 ohms to ground and that was 50 ohms to ground and we simply pulled these signals far enough apart that they were not cross talking that they were not coupling excessively then 50 to ground here 50 to ground there that would give me the same 100 ohms line to line that we normally talk about but I still maintain the 50 ohms or the the single ended impedance to ground while still getting the differential impedance line to line now Lee Ritchie went through and he did a very a famous experiment uh, the first first part of this was that he ran two traces they were uh, Z zero over the ground plane uh, the height above the ground plane was H the distance between the two traces edge to edge was 3h so in other words they were wide enough apart that there was very little coupling between them and he, and he simply had uh, a driver on this end a receiver on that end and ran it and when we and then uh, documented what the uh, eye diagram looked like and the eye diagram looked absolutely perfect 
he had a second trace on the same board only in this case it wandered around and there was obviously no constant separation between these two signals it's just that they were the same electrical length that is they were both uh, the, the same length on the board they were the same impedance now there wasn't anything else trying to cross talk onto this but the only point was they were both the same length now when he did that he documented the second eye diagram and the second eye diagram looked pretty much like the first eye diagram you really couldn't see any difference I mean you might be able to imagine that the second one was a tiny bit smaller but you know it was it, it was hard to tell did a third experiment and in the third experiment um, instead of having the the lines equal he put an SMA connector here he put an SMA connector there put an SMA connector there and an SMA connector there and then he had two matched coaxial cables that he connected to these things and now the, the, the we're not even talking about uh, signals on the board we're talking about going through coax cables and amazingly the eye diagram looked the same now what was the point of Lee's experiment here it was to try to prove once and for all that there is nothing magic about the 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 line to line impedance here if you talk about the impedance being 50 ohms to ground and this one being 50 ohms to ground ergo this is going to be 100 ohms line to line then that's a perfectly solid way of thinking about it but if you're going to think about it uh, as being some magic differential thing then that is not true now one of the key issues that that everybody had to deal with in this is that uh, and what Lee was trying to prove is where is the return current if the signal is here on a plus the return current for a plus is primarily on this plane it is not on the other member of the pair now if you pull these things closer together you can get more coupling and that's the old argu argument about loose coupling and tight coupling but if you pull it closer together and you get the tighter coupling wonderful you can save board space doing that but don't uh, operate with the idea that electrically you are doing yourself uh, any great uh, favors by doing that you do save board space you can make some kind of argument about having better common mode rejection but if you look at the real distances on the board I would say that that's a fairly specious sort of argument uh, but as you pull these things closer together all you're doing is you're increasing crosstalk you are going to end up making the eye smaller and you end up uh, complicating uh, the issue so okay well if you have phone calls or arguments uh, give me a call and we can go through that but the main point is here is that is the way it works so when we're trying to make a Serdes circuit work remember that we've got a transmitter we got a receiver we got stuff in the middle and as a board designer primarily the only thing that you can you can affect is the stuff in the middle so we can take care of attenuation uh, impedance discontinuities crosstalk as far as the traces are concerned we can look at the vias and how they perform and what the rest of this uh, set of videos are about is a primarily about the stuff in the middle we will do some end-to-end -end, uh, simulations to show you how that works but primarily we're talking about uh, how do you make the stuff in the middle work better as opposed to using some old uh, I don't know old engineers tales about uh, this thing being a true differential circuit and doing things that are not in your best interest
So if we're to make sense of this stuff, we must remember that currents are determined by field coupling and the return current is the other side of the high-speed serial LVDS type signal. Now, if you foul that up beyond what the noise margin can handle, you will have issues. Now let me throw out right up front. You can, you can abuse the daylights out of a Cerdes signal as long as you do not exceed what the noise margin can handle. As soon as you exceed what the noise margin can handle, that's where we've got a problem. So there are all sorts of crazy things that I have seen that people have gotten away with, but that doesn't mean that it's good design practice, and it doesn't mean that you should do it and expect to have uh, success in your design. So the follow-on uh, videos are going to be talking about these three areas and how they work, and uh, that's it for section two.